right now, take your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 13 as we continue our series in the book of Revelation. Revelation 13. Revelation 13, verses 11 to 18 is our passage for this morning. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. If you're visiting with us today, this is a bizarre passage, and you've come to a, a fun service. So as we get into this passage, let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truthfulness, even in some of its more cryptic passages. And so may your spirit enlighten us and may he challenge us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think our generation, especially of the last two decades, will, from a pop culture perspective, be known for our, the, 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 the the reality TV craze that we have bought into. I've never been a fan of reality TV. I think it's just weird, okay, and why we want to see and peer into the lives of others. But some people love reality TV. Uh, <laughs> the real housewives of whatever city across America, right? Like, I just don't get that craziness and why we want to watch that stuff. But I did like early on shows like the first few seasons of Survivor. That was a pretty cool show. Or The Amazing Race or something like that. But, but one that I still can't believe our culture allowed to happen, especially, and it still goes on, is The Bachelor, right? Like this show where you are objectifying women. It looks like a guy building his harem right there. How is our culture, in light of the Me Too movement, allowing that to be still going on. It just seems bizarre to me. But in the early craze of The Bachelor, that was on ABC. And if you don't know what The Bachelor is, it's a guy who gets a whole, I'm, get, I'm, I'm saying harem because that's what it looks like, a whole harem of women and he gets to choose after making out and dating with and pretty much doing everything he wants with these women, figuring out which one he's going to pick and then she can be with him. I mean, what a, what a crazy premise for a show. That was ABC. My show that I did watch for the one season it was good that I thought was hilarious was on Fox, and that was Joe Millionaire. Did you guys see Joe Millionaire? Anybody remember that show at all? This was the parody of The Bachelor. Joe Millionaire was in the midst of the craze of these women fawning after a bachelor was let's take a group of women to a French chateau with this amazing opulence and wealth and let's put this average looking guy in there but he's incredibly wealthy and watch these women fawn over him. And all of these women showed up thinking that they were going to end up with this incredibly rich guy even though he looked like the average Joe, plumber. Well, uh, the whole gist of the show was he wasn't rich. He was the average Joe. And <laughs> these women who are fawning over this idiot are falling in love with a story and everything else that will prove false in the end. And it did capture attention of America. It was an incredibly highly rated show as far as viewership because you couldn't help but be drawn in because you wanted to watch the rug get pulled out from underneath these women at the very end, that they're making out with Joe the plumber, essentially, 
to get his wealth, and it's not real. The show played off of the desires of wealth, of relationship, to dupe the unsuspecting with an illusion of the real. But it wasn't. The show only really worked for one season because once the cat was out of the rabbit was out of the hat, it was all over, right? I mean, you weren't going to recreate that. And while Joe Millionaire was a farce and a comedy, this is the exact scheme the dragon runs to bring about not comedic ends, but tragic ends. In the passage before us today, we see the third member of this counterfeit trinity, and he is used to promote the agenda of the great dragon and the dragon's beast from the sea, the Antichrist figure here, the fake Christ. In later passages of Revelation, Revelation 16 and 17, this individual will be referred to as the false prophet, which demonstrates that there's a a religious connection to him. Part of what he is about is the religious side of things. This beast emerges from the land, contrasting or comparing with the one who emerged from the sea last week. What are the tactics of this second beast? Let's unpack this a little bit, and you can see some tactics that he uses. The first is that he appears as a lamb, but speaks as a dragon. I saw this beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. Remember, the the lamb that Jesus was earlier had the seven horns in chapter 5 of Revelation. And so we see another two-horned creature here looking like a lamb in many ways, trying to look like a lamb, and yet at the same time speaking like a dragon. The imagery foreshadows the activity of this beast. He accomplishes a a religious role. He will bring attention to the first beast. He will speak on behalf and promote the first beast but all the time being empowered by and speaking with the voice of the dragon. The first beast was primarily a political figure and will be a political figure. The second beast is primarily a promoter, and yet he's doing so through a religious bent. We're seeing here the merging of religion and politics, politics, a a worship system of the state The leader in this text, the first beast, will be deified. And those promoting him or her will be making such religious claims with their political and their economic influence that drives people to follow this first beast. And when you hear of this, you can't help but be drawn to church history and throughout church history the strong alliances that have seemingly been made between state and religion. I mean, there's nations in this world that have national religions to them, right? Because of how closely tied historically religion is to state power. Now, in the United States, we have primarily rejected that in our own constitutional documents. we, We recognize the freedom of all people and the freedom of religion to worship as you please. But we as Christians must not be deceived. Don't be deceived, Christian, to think that this doesn't happen in our nation today. This aligning of politics of power with a religious bent to it. I mean, every time there's a political election, either in a community or on a national stage, we see Reverend so-and-so or Pastor so-and-so alongside the political leader promoting and speaking and trying to get this person elected. And that happens really on both sides of the political aisle.
How do you know this is occurring, this sort of thing is occurring? And I'm going to mention a few key ideas that point in this direction, and the first of them is this. Wherever this is the case where religion and politics are starting to be merged, the gospel disappears. Meaning the language of whoever is the promoter is no longer about bringing faith in Jesus Christ to people. It's about highlighting the individual, highlighting the savior that this guy is going to be. So keep that in mind and don't be stupid and swallow this stuff down. He will look like the lamb, but what's coming out of the mouth is the dragon, is the system, is the beast. That's the first tactic of this second beast. The second is found in verse 12. It exercised all of the authority of the first beast on its behalf, made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. The second tactic is that this Second beast uses his authority to bring worship to the first beast. He acts to highlight the miraculous nature of the first beast. Speaking of using his authority on behalf of this beast, and John brings up again the fact that this first beast had this fatal wound that had been healed. The, the false prophet here, this second beast, is, is given its authority and receives its authority from the first beast from the Antichrist and uses his authority to benefit this other beast, to bring worship to this other beast. And he's leading a religion that promotes the first beast as God. And he'll do this by pointing to the supposed supernatural things that are happening in this first beast. And we are reminded of this wound that had been healed, this parody of, a, of a, a death and a resurrection, as if to point to the fact that this first beast, this false Christ, this antichrist, is himself the son of God. He performs signs like a prophet. He speaks and exercises authority, performs great signs, verse 13, even causing fire to come down from heaven, to the earth in full view of the people. He can do things associated with God's greatest prophets. Some of the fire being called down from heaven reminds us of whom in the Old Testament? Elijah, right? This beast will do things similar to God's own prophets. Can the other side, the evil side, do the supernatural, do the miraculous? Yes. In fact, if you go back to Moses and the deliverance from Exodus, right, what were the, the other prophets, the, the miracle workers of Egypt able to do? They were able to mimic and do many of the same miracles that Moses was able to do. And it reminds us even of his speech that he will suck in and bring in many of the inhabitants of the earth to follow him and follow this first beast. He mimics the power of the, the two witnesses we saw earlier in Revelation 11. And we're reminded of Jesus' own words in Matthew 24 to his disciples. And I think there's still a strong warning to us as he's speaking of these last days. Jesus said, in those days, or if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened if at that time, if anyone says to you, Matthew 24, 23, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So you see, Jesus says, I have told you ahead of time. Jesus is saying, I'm telling you this to warn you so that you're on the alert. I will not come like this, Jesus is saying. And so if you see someone claiming to have the power of Christ, claiming Jesus Christ, but not pointing people to the gospel and Jesus as true Lord and our lives in submission to him, this is false Messiah. This is antichrist and reject that. 
You see, this is not done as some religious act, but a public relations spectacle to impress and to bring about worship, worship of the first beast. The third tactic of this beast in verses 14 and 15 is that he deceives people to worship the false system of the first beast. Because of the signs it was given to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. Satan's main weapon is not so much power, brute force. Satan's main weapon is what? Deception. He is the great deceiver. He's able to take truth and spin it in his direction and how he wants to manipulate and how he wants to draw attention away from God and to himself. This is his tactic in the garden and he still is doing it today, and he will do it through these beings described here. This second beast causes the people of the world to fall in line with his false worship. These abilities are given to him on behalf of the Antichrist, and so we get that language of passive given again, which, yes, it's given by the dragon, yes, it's given by the Antichrist, but it's given ultimately or allowed, let's put it that way, by God. God allows these earth dwellers to be given over to their wickedness and to follow these two beasts. Why? Because they are rejecting the truth, they are rejecting God, and they are choosing to put their hope in another. This is exactly what's talked about in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. They will follow this great delusion they will think we're following Christ. We, they think we're actually doing what God has created us to do, and yet they are following deception. Notice how far this goes. It ordered them, this beast, to the earth dwellers to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And the, the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. The deception goes so far that this beast is able to convince the earth dwellers to make an image of the first beast. Where do we see that in Scripture? A powerful being standing up, thinking of himself as God and creating a statue, an image for all to fall down and worship. I mean, this is Daniel 3, right? This is Nebuchadnezzar. This is playing off of that story. But it has Greco-Roman connotation as well. We saw, remember when we preached through the seven churches, many of those cities had what in them? Temples devoted to not only the local deities, but also to Caesar. And they would erect massive statues of Caesar in their city, and they would worship Caesar as Savior, Caesar as Son of God. In fact, by the end of the first century, all of the cities in Revelation that are mentioned had a statue like this erected in their city, drawing attention to the supposed Lord of the day. And this is a parody again of Christ. Now, I've had some discussion with some of you about, is this playing out of the first century background? Is this only talking about Caesar? Does it really, is it going to happen sometime in the future? I, I think what Revelation is suggesting is sort of both. It, it meant things in that day, but this is going to culminate before Christ returns in, in something like this reoccurring on the earth. What is it going to look like, Phil? I got no idea, okay? I, I really don't. But it's using imagery from that first century to warn even us today that there will come false messiahs, people who are claiming to speak with the very power of God, and yet they're drawing attention away from God and toward something else that's part of this world system that will ultimately culminate in this battle sides being drawn up between the people of God and the people of this world. And it will coalesce, I think, in these beings at the end before Christ returns. This beast will empower this idol. It'll, it will, the deception will be so great that the, the, um, 
idol will speak. And again, I don't even know what that would look like. But the magicians and the sorcerers of that day were able to make claims like we can make an idol like this move and speak and try to, because that would so impress people. And I think that's the imagery here, that what is done here will so impress the people of this earth that it will, it will contribute to the deception. It will make people think they're believing truth, that they're believing reality, that this is the work of God here when it's not. One of the scariest things to me about much of our present world's system is how much of what goes on in this world and the things of this world empowered by what I would call supernatural evil, how much of that is promoted in the name of Christ or scripture is used to back up even some of that very evil. Political candidates, again, we'll go back to that because they make such an easy target, but how many of them evoke Scripture for their personal gain? Two Thessalonians, two Corinthians, calling on Scripture, so-called Christians and pastors speaking on the hot-button issues of our day, yet slyly twisting the very Word of God to teach things that are contrary to the Word of God. It's talking to one of our... I'll just be kind of open about this. I was talking to my older daughter a couple of years ago now about even the, uh, what's going on in our world, what she was seeing in her school and even in her own mind was wrestling with about things like gender and sexuality. And, and, and Hallie is one of those who is a very, uh, she's very logical and she is very intelligent. And so, Dad, what about this pastor over here online that I'm finding that says Jesus never condemned this? Or that Jesus is about love and you, you, you go online and you find pastors and scholars in the name of Jesus Christ who are claiming stuff that is obviously contrary to the clear teaching of the word of God. That's part of the deception. To twist, to teach things that are totally and obviously against the clear teaching of the word of God. James Hamilton, in his commentary on Revelation, has this to say about this. This passage is giving us fair warning. Just because someone claims to be a Christian does not mean he or she is. Just because someone uses the language of Christianity does not mean he or she is promoting Christianity. And just because someone looks like Jesus does not mean he or she genuinely represents him. If a person says that people are basically good, that it doesn't help people to tell them that they are sinners, that the important thing to have is a lot of money and worldly treasure, and that you can be a good person apart from faith in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, that person is speaking like the dragon, not like Jesus Christ. Hamilton goes on to say this person is blaspheming Jesus by denigrating the power and the significance of the cross and saying that we really don't need Jesus. Jesus really isn't the great treasure and Jesus didn't need to go to the cross at all. Do you see how easily manipulated people are into following something, including their own hearts, that are leading them in a direction that is opposed to what Christ clearly says, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one else will ever get to the Father except through him, his sacrifice, his life. Again, no matter how miraculous it might look or how much a person might sound like he is speaking for God and speaking about love, if his message isn't leading people to place their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the message isn't Christian. 
and it's not Christ. And notice where this leads. The second beast, verse 15, was given this power to give breath to the image, to bring the worship to the image so that the image could speak and it caused all who refused to worship the image to be what? Killed. The end of this guy's game is not life, it is death. He kills those who refuse to worship the beast. The result of this image being built is the execution of anybody who did not worship it. Again, a a look back to what do Christians need to do in such a context. We need to look no further than Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3. We will not bow down to this system, even if that means we pass through the fire. Recognize that many of us won't be called to pass through fires. But Revelation reminds us that Christ may ask some of us to do that. He will allow believers to suffer and to be martyred for their testimony of the gospel to show that there's something greater that empowers those who side with Jesus Christ. This is such a huge point. The genuine Christ, the true Christ, and those who follow Christ sacrifice themselves to save others. And it's amazing to me how much the world resonates with that story in theory. I was just listening to a podcast this weekend uh, from Frank Turek and Mike Heiser, and they were talking about Turek's latest book on Hollywood heroes and scripture. I, I don't remember what the name of the book is. It's something along that lines. But it's looking at all of these movies and how the gospel is in there, even if the person promoting it isn't a Christian. But think about how those stories resonate with this world. Why do we like Tony Stark so much as Iron Man? Tony Stark has everything this world's offering at the very beginning. He has wealth. He has women. He has popularity. He has power and influence. And yet at the very beginning of the Marvel arc of Tony Stark, is he happy? No. He can't find purpose until he finds what? A significance, something to give his life to. And by the very end of the story of the Avengers, what does Tony Stark do? He sacrifices himself to save the world. And the world loves that. I mean, if Iron Man at the great battle, right, with Thanos stood up and said, you know what, guys, I'm out, I'm leaving, I'm not gonna do this, I'm going back to my old life, and that's how the movie ended, we would all just boo What have we watched? The world would hate that because the world knows this is what they want and yet they reject it when it comes to Jesus Christ. And yet they will follow something that doesn't save them. It will ultimately what them? Kill them because that's what this system wants to do. It wants to kill, not save The end of these beasts is death. Think about what the religious system of our government is saying today. To find satisfaction in happiness and contentment in this world, you must express your authentic, real self, the one that's living inside of you. That's your real reality. That's your real truth. Not denying self, but embracing self. Embracing self for you. For one, that has nothing to do with anybody else in this world. It has all to do with you. It's the most selfish game there is. But on top of that, look at what that ends in. Think about what the pro-abortion argument ends in. It ends in what? Death. When you choose self, it ends in death. Destruction. Think about what our teenagers are being told to mutilate their bodies to express their real self. That's destroying themselves. And it's going to end in death and destruction. 
Because that's what this beast does. It holds out a truth, it appeals, and yet it destroys in the end. Because it's not Jesus Christ. And it's fascinating to me how our world wants a message, a gospel, that ends in somebody laying down their lives. But don't ask that of me to sacrifice myself. Have somebody else do that. And yet they won't embrace it in Christ. The fourth tactic of this beast is that he pressures economically to align with the first beast. Verses 16 and 17, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, such that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. In his vision, John sees everyone on the earth being required to show their allegiance to the first beast, the Antichrist, by receiving a mark on their right hands or their foreheads. In the visionary world of Revelation, this stands in stark contrast to Revelation 7, when God seals or marks on the foreheads those who are his own, his people. Revelation 7, 2 to 4. It's playing off of an imagery that was very common in that day for slaves, soldiers, or even members of certain religions to be tattooed or branded to show their ownership, their allegiance, their devotion. They would have the name of whatever they were or are or represented placed on them. And this is the point here because John is showing us that there really is no neutrality in this world. You either belong to Christ or you belong to the beast. You're marked in one of two ways. You're either with God or you're against him. And in this vision, before Christ returns, the entire economy, the entire commerce system will be tied to this acceptance of the mark of the beast. This will be the way that the state keeps tabs on those who are aligning with them. In Nebuchadnezzar's day, it was you all bow down. Who's left standing? In the end time scenario, it's who doesn't have this mark. So what does that mean for us? What are we looking for? Are we looking for, you know, like, People taking brands out and sticking 666 on your forehead? Is that, is that what we're anticipating here? Could this be something different like a barcode? I mean, what, what's going on? My daughter came home from Summer Blast uh, the Friday night. And she had a duck tattooed on her forehead. and Mark of the beast right there, Emily's tattooed. We witnessed to her very vehemently that night to get her to confess Christ and askew... <laughs> Satan, I really don't believe this mark, okay, hear me out, I don't believe this mark is a literal marking on our foreheads and our hands. It's a parody, again, of a mimicry, like we're seeing throughout this chapter, of those who are distinctively marked as people of God. How did Israel in the Old Testament, do you remember this? They, they bore the name of their God on them. They, they wore, in Deuteronomy 6, phylacteries on their foreheads and they bound them around their hands to remind them that who they belonged to, they belonged, and in those little boxes they placed Yahweh's name in there. They, they belong, or the, the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord our God, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. It was, it was a bearing of the name of Yahweh. They belonged to him. They were committed in theory to him, and with their hands, they worked that out in what they did. And yet, this imagery parodies that, because the people of this world will follow the deception. They will bear the name of the beast. And the people of God will suffer economically, and may even be called to give their lives for their loyalty to Christ, but because they bear the name of Christ, what? They have eternal life. I think this passage indicates that pressure is going to come, and I think it's coming. I don't know that it's going to get there yet in some of our lifetimes, but it's coming even in our own country to reveal where our true loyalty lies. Are we with Christ or are we with this world's system? Are we with Christ or are we with the false Christs that rule our world's system? You see, the followers of the beast will be able to financially and culturally prosper 
But their future, their eternity is what? Destruction. And we'll see that as Revelation unfolds. All right, let's get down to verse 18. What's going on here in the last verse? A warning to us, very much like we saw in verses 9 and 10. He who has ears, let him hear. This calls for wisdom. Let the person with insight calculate this number of the beast. For it's the number of a man, and that number is 666. We are to be ever watchful for the deception, I think, is the warning here. Believers are called to take great care. Use godly discernment. To do what? To interpret the number of the beast. The mark is identified as a number here. It's a name and a number. Where you're called to use great discernment and wisdom to calculate. And that's a mathematical term. Calculate out this number. And it represents a name. The people in John's day would understand what he was doing with this number and what he was calling them to calculate because it would refer to a particular man. Now, this verse is one of the most controversial in all the New Testament, and there has probably been more written in speculation on what this is talking about than almost any other verse. And there's some really interesting things around this number, because it does some wild stuff when you start playing with it, especially out of some things like the Pythagorean number theorems of triangular and square numbers and rectangular numbers and what this thing all does and how it shows up. So I'll play on that in a second. But the best solution I still think to this is to utilize what was an ancient practice, especially in Hebrew apocalyptic literature around the time of John, a practice known as gematria, or using the letters of a word or a name to calculate a number. It was common in Hebrew apocalyptic literature to take the letters of the alphabet and assign them a number value. So A would represent 1, B would represent 2, C would represent 3. And once you got to 9 around, I don't know, J or something like that, the next letter would be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, till you got up to 90. And then the next sets of letters would be 100, 200, 300, 400 until you ran out of alphabet. Not English alphabet here, okay? Hebrew alphabet and the Hebrew letters and the order of them. And Jewish apocalyptic literature would do this with names. And so you could take a name or a title and you could try to plug it back in using those letters to do this. And the best name when you plug this in is the name of Nero with the title Caesar attached to it. In Hebrew, that comes out as Caesar Neron. All right, and it ends with an N on the end of his name because that's how it would have been in a Greek or the Latin formalization of that. And you bring those letters then over to Hebrew, and when you assign them the corresponding Hebrew letters, they add up to 666. And that makes the most sense of this particular name. If this is a correct understanding, then I think what John is saying here is Nero has already died. Now, there was There was fascination with Nero even after Nero's death. They thought he would come back because he died in a very mysterious way. And there was even rumors that Nero had risen and was coming back. And so all of that was in the mindset of the Greco-Roman world of that time. John's playing off of that a little bit. And he's suggesting here that this figure will be very much like Nero was. One who was about promotion of self. One who was about torture of Christians, one who was about killing them for his own glory and his own promotion. There's a couple of other things that fascinate me about this number, though. And I do think it does represent this system versus what, this, what Christ is building. It's, it's a parody, again, a mimicry of, of Christ. Somebody came up to me last week, and was, or a couple weeks ago, and was explaining to me, you do know that 666, if you take all of the numbers, 1 through 36, and add them together, you get 666, right? And I was like, I did not know that. No, I didn't, okay? But it's true. And that gets into the Pythagorean mathematics. They would play with things like, what happens if you add up all of the numbers, and then what set does that fall in? And, and what happens if you add up all of the squares, and what about all of the rectangular numbers, and, and it plays off of a number of things. But it is a fascinating thing that 
666 is the 36th number that comes up if you add up all of these numbers. Why is that important? Because it's a six number. What is 36? 36 is a six number. It's the squaring of six. And you see all of these sixes being played on in this particular number. And why is that important? Well, think about, this is just one aspect of this, but think about this in Revelation. What have we seen about the people of God? What number characterizes them? Seven's one. So this falls just short of seven. That's one of the plays off it. Twelve. The 24 elders, 12 and 12. We're going to see 144,000, which is 12 squared times 12 squared times 1,000. In fact, that's the exact next verse in chapter 14. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000. When we get to the New Jerusalem, there will be 12 parts to this city as it's measured out, and it's 12,000 miles squared. And when you multiply that out, you get the 144,000 again. That's the number of Christ and his people. But half of 12 is six, and it's, the, it's showing that this does not measure up. It's a parody and falls short of Christ's system by half. There's all kinds of crazy stuff that goes on with this number, and I don't want to keep going down that road. Here's the point. It's a mockery and a mimicry of Christ. And in so doing, it's going to come again and call the believer to be willing to lay their life down in sacrifice to hold and cling to Christ, to demonstrate to this world that we follow one who gives us eternal life, not who promises us promotion in this. Be ever watchful for the deception that this system is offering. The main idea is that believers must remain vigilant to the deceptive nature of the false worship of this world. While our world may come across, and I said this earlier, I think our, our country likes to promote itself as freedom of religion, of, of accepting of all. And in our secular world today, especially in our secular world, we come across as non-religious or even anti-religious. We don't want anything to do with Christianity or this religious system. Remember this, believer. Satan's primary war is a religious war. He's after the hearts of people. He's after their lives. And the real power behind this world system and this world's leadership is molded and used by the present ruler of this age who stands opposed to God and opposed to the followers of God. We must recognize that the powers and the lures of this world, the things that Satan uses to entrap and destroy lives, are spiritual idols that cause many to be deceived and many who call themselves Christians to be ineffective for the cause of Christ. As Craig Kester says in his commentary, we need to wrestle with the idea of whether or not we have too readily blurred the lines between the claims of the Lamb and those of the seemingly benign group that promotes the worship of this world's system. We have wedded too closely Christianity with power, Christianity with wealth, Christianity with present satisfaction, And we've blurred the lines of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ in the process. You see, this group that stands opposed to Christ and might even claim Christ while deceiving isn't innocent. They aren't benign, but they are being sinisterly used or unwittingly deceived to follow a path and leaders of evil that end in destruction. That's what this world's system is all about. Therefore, believer, what? Be alert. Wake up. And see what's truly being offered by this world's system. It's not Christ. It's a pseudo-Christ. And the promoters of it are pseudo-false prophets that are leading us to destruction. We're going to end this morning with communion. And the communion, again, is, a, I think, a great reminder of where your allegiance lies. Because when you take this, that's the pledge you're making. 
I belong to Christ. I follow Christ, and I follow what? A sacrifice. He sacrificed his life, and I'm proclaiming that as I even lay my life down to take up his cross and follow him. Let's close in a word of prayer before we enter communion this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word, even the bizarre parts of it. It points us, Lord, to a reality in our world that is, is, is mimicking, is parroting, is, is holding out a hope of, of, of prosperity, of wealth, of success, of satisfaction that in the end will pull the rug out and it'll only leave us falling on our faces. Not in humiliation, Lord, but in destruction. And so may you cause those of us who are the followers of Christ here at Clearwater Community Church to wrestle with a text like this, to see through the deception of this world's system, to not align ourselves with with power or wealth or thinking, Lord, that if I follow self, this is my true reality, but to recognize that that is a rejection of everything that your word stands for, everything that your word teaches, everything your word tells us is truth. And Lord, may we see through it to follow Jesus Christ so that we can shine as light and be salt in a culture, Lord, that is so anti you that you still use us effectively to reach some of those that are blinded, to release them from their shackles, to, to pull back the blinders from their eyes, to remove those scales so that they see the light of Jesus Christ and ultimately come to faith in him. Lord, as we come to this communion table, that's what we say we are all about. But wait, may we not be just hearers and proclaimers of that, but may we be doers of that with our lives. Laying our life down because you sacrificed yourself for us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.